Well, good morning and thank you for your kind welcome. I don't think I've ever been quite introduced like that before. And it's a little strange here today being uh, on two screens right in front of you and no one in the middle. But I'll be right there in just a few minutes. I often say this, either we take hold of the future or the future will take hold of us. Future is either something that you see coming towards you, which are the trends that we're going to look at, like the economic trends, and the business environment, competitive environment, people environment, political issues, and so on. Or you can say, we take hold of our future, we make history happen. And that's the choice in front of us today. Now you can have the best strategy in the world, but the fact of the matter is that if the world changes unexpectedly, you can get left behind because as fast as you make the future, it's changing somewhere else. And that's why we have to keep an eye on these trends on the one hand, and on the other hand, not be dominated by those trends, but seek to take hold of them and use them to, uh, both to qualify our risks and to maximize the opportunities. I spent a lot of my time looking not at the center of the radar screen, but on the outer edge, at the small blips uh, that you see appear and disappear. These uh, low uh, intensity signals which sometimes move at high speed. Many of them are what I would call wild cards. They are low probability but potentially very high impact possibilities. They're things which could open up enormous business opportunities quite quickly or indeed post tremendous risks. Now these 1% per year type of risks are more frequent than you might think. Why? Because there are simply so many of them. If there are three or four hundred of such risks inside an organization or indeed inside a single company in which you're investing, then you can find that in a single year maybe three or four of such risks may go off. Now that's quite a significant uh, thing when you think about it and has to be considered very carefully. Some people say it's a complete waste of time looking at the future because it's all full of these kinds of wildcard scenarios and quite frankly no one can predict the future. Well you might think that's true but on the other hand if that really was the case then Nokia's wasting its time, Microsoft is a waste of space, Google, well what planet are they living on? The fact is that every large innovative company spends a huge amount of time thinking about current trends and maximizing them using innovation, creativity and all kinds of other technologies and things like that to seize a competitive advantage. And in fact, many of the world's greatest and most important trends are obvious as soon as you start to think about them and are relatively certain. Let's look at a few examples. Technology. We know that the cost of computing is falling towards zero. The cost of telecom is falling towards zero. We know that when you combine these two things together, you get a further extension of the network society. Those things are obvious. We know that the population in the European Union is aging. We'll be looking at demographics later on today because it is such an important trend. Now, listen, I mean, there's no excuse for a so-called pensions crisis within the European Union. We've known that pensions are going to be a challenge for the last 30 years. It's been locked in history by the fact that not very many babies were born in a particular period of time and we have a big bulge because there were loads of babies born in the previous period of time and that is going to take 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 more years to work its way through the system. So barring a, a nuclear holocaust or a massive bird flu pandemic or some other catastrophic event we could have seen this pensions crisis a long time ago. So whether it's telecom, whether it's aging, whether it's improvements in healthcare, a whole host of other things, I would say lots of things in the future are relatively certain. And that's the basis of what we do. So, we're going to look at six phases of the future. They spell the future, F-U-T-U-R-E. Uh, but before we look at those, I've just got a couple of observations to make. I tend to think of the future as a cube, as a multi-dimensional object, which uh, you can turn in different ways and see in different ways at different stages of your life in different stages of your own business cycle. And the future is personal. It's not just about your business. It's about your own life, your family, your friends and everything else. It's about what happens in your community and to the great nation of South Africa. So let's have a look at the future then. The six phases of the future, they spell the word F-U-T-U-R-E and the first is the speed of change. 
and I often uh, think about this. You know, when I'm waiting for a lift in a hotel like this one here in the Hilton, uh, I observe that some people press the lift button more than once. Now, I confess to you, I'm one of those people. I know I shouldn't do it, but l let me just ask a question. Okay, confession time. Who here, I want you to put your hands up. Yes, I really, really do. I want you to put your hands up in the air and wave them if you have pressed the lift button more than once when you are waiting for it. Okay. Well, look around. <laughs> look, uh, let me tell you, I I'm benchmarking RMB against uh, every other large institution in the world, and I can tell you that around 55.5% of all senior executives in every company in the world that I have ever talked to press the lift button not just once, but many times when they're in a hurry, when there's a big queue and nothing seems to be happening. <laughs> Think about it. We are intelligent, sane human beings. Yet when we are under pressure because of the speed of life and the tremendous challenges of getting things done on time, we behave irrationally. And that's one of the very first lessons about the future, that it's not just to do with logic, spreadsheets, analysis, and all the rest of it. It's to do with something that's actually far more fundamental to the future. It's to do with emotion. And we see the same word as incredibly important in the reactions to historical events. It's the reactions to what happens that is more important usually than the events themselves. You just ask a broadcaster or a, a, a media journalist what they think about that. They will tell you it's always the same. The strength of a news story, it might be a scandal about a company, a competitor, it might even be about you, I hope not, but the strength of a story is usually totally unrelated to the nature of the event itself and is everything to do with whether on that day, in that month, with that community, it struck an emotional chord and it resonated and created a massive reaction or not. When the tsunami disaster happened, uh, it, there was a massive media coverage. It was a massive event, yes. But there was another event which also was a major catastrophe, which was the earthquake in Pakistan. Now, the fact is that the impact on human beings in terms of suffering after that disaster was far greater from the earthquake than the tsunami. Simple reason. Those that didn't survive died. Those that survived were usually relatively okay. In the earthquake zone, it was the opposite. Huge numbers of people were affected and then the problems began week by week as winter came in and tens of thousands died of starvation, hunger, in extreme conditions. But which attracted the most attention? Well, it was the tsunami of course. The reason? One of the reasons was that there were tourists, western tourists, caught up in it in those very remote areas. And it was their stories, their emotional uh, anguish, grief, and everything else that spread around the world and captured the hearts and minds of people in those countries. That's why we don't believe market research. Market research is a very blunt tool to try to understand the future. The reason people don't understand what they're going to feel in the future. You may ask them what they feel today about what they will do tomorrow, but they're usually wrong when you go much further than a few months. And we've seen many examples of that in financial services, investment, retail banking, whatever you like. I'm going to show you a video which is an example of this. This particular video was a TV ad created for audiences in Europe and the rest of the world. And it was shown briefly in my country. It scored 10 out of 10 for market research. Everyone loved it. But as soon as they showed it on TV in the UK, it was promptly banned. I'm going to show you the video, and I'm interested in why you think it was banned.
so what do you think? I mean, yeah. I mean, what happened to the British sense of humour? There are many uh, audiences I've shown it to, and they've laughed, they've <laughs> they thought it was funny. Yes, some objected to it, uh, but why would it be banned? Well, the answer is, in my country, the reason that video was banned was that there were so many complaints. And at the end of the day, they decided that it was ugh, in poor taste. They just uh, couldn't think of a formal reason to ban it, they just did it. So. What do we learn then? The future is about emotion. Many things are uncertain to do with wild cards, these low probability but high impact risks. In each of those, there can be a major opportunity in financial services, in investment. And at the same time, there are many bigger trends which are worth a really close review because we think we know all about them, and of course we do. But it's when we put these different trends together in new ways that we begin to see patterns that can help unlock competitive advantage for the future. And that's really what part of this day is all about.